so I would like to introduce Asia Bagchi, who is the winner of our student speech contest. This fall, the oral communication program invited students to submit a teaching tale, a text of an oral presentation on teaching and teachers and their effect on their undergraduate experience. Asia's articulate meditation on one professor in particular and on teaching in general distinguished her submission from all the others, although there were strong ones among those as well. She is majoring in philosophy and history with honors in ethics and society. And some of you may have seen her byline on her column, Sense and Nonsense. I was afraid I'd say Sense and Sensibility <laughs> um, in the daily. And she is currently one of two students who is serving on the study of undergraduate education at Stanford Task Force. So please join me in welcoming Asia Bagchi. And please, people, come forward and sit down. There, there are seats. I think we can have everyone sit down and relax and enjoy themselves. Please do. <laughs> yeah. Okay, hi, everyone. Um, I want to start by telling the story of a learning experience I had during spring quarter of my freshman year in a class called Existentialism. Let me say that again, Existentialism. Mm -hmm. To my freshman self, the name alone was intimidating, um, and the list of authors was even worse. The syllabus said we would read works by Rousseau, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, Jean-Paul Sartre, Simone de Beauvoir, Camus. If any class seemed up in the clouds, seemed to epitomize my image of a university professor talking about abstract stuff that had absolutely nothing to do with the real world. It was existentialism. But I was very wrong. This was a course that quite literally rocked my world. In every class, our philosophy professor, Lanier Anderson, I saw him, he's there. <laughs> Lanier Anderson illustrated how what we studied was really about life. Lanier would describe how Sartre's conception of how one acts in good faith might be violated when 20-year-olds misrepresent themselves through something as simple as flirting. He had us read Akhil Bilgrami's article, What is a Muslim?, to think about the relation between existentialism and Muslim identity in the context of absolutist and moderate Islam. The philosophies we read invaded my everyday thinking. Was I in a condition of permanent despair? <laughs> could, I, could I ever be free? Um, what did it mean to be true to myself and to live an autonomous life? Lanier showed the natural relation between what he taught and the reasons humanity studies it. Our last lecture was a true culmination. After a quarter spent discussing all these big life issues, Lanier talked about a friend of his from his time in college who discovered he had an incurable terminal disease and truly, at our moment in life, was forced to come to terms with the universal human condition of ultimate death and all the questions about identity and meaning that it prompts. My Stanford professor, I could see, was holding back tears as he related how his dear friend had proven truly able to accept all the impossibilities and contradictions embedded in the human condition. That and other lectures have come into dialogue with my life in intellectual and personal ways time and again. Two years later, Lanier and I were invited to join a university task force, the study of undergraduate education at Stanford. One day last spring, we had a meeting with a few guests from the different schools to talk about the aims of a Stanford edu education. And after some frustration with what I thought was missing from the conversation, I tried to engage the guests in discussing whether college should be thought of as an isolated intellectual enterprise or whether it needed to... Um, whether it needed to encourage students to reflect on ourselves and our world in the context of what we are taught. I thought it was vital to synthesize students' academic, intellectual, and personal development, vital on intellectual, moral, and personal fronts. After our meeting, when everyone had left Sweet Hall, Lanier took a moment to thank me privately for reminding professors, who are now, perhaps, at some distance from their former college selves, that college remains an intellectually and personally transformative time that, as he put it, the soul in education is not yet dead. I had never before talked to Lanier about my experience in his class, but in that moment I began to explain how it had awakened me during my freshman year 
excited my curiosity and helped me grasp that hidden secret that our education, be it focused on existentialism, quantum mechanics, evolutionary biology, or Shakespeare, relates to real life. I mentioned how I had felt when he gave his lecture on Camus' The Plague and discussed conditions of despair, how precious his last lecture remains to me. And I could see, without his saying anything, that emotions welled up inside him. It was a moment of gratitude on my part, and maybe on his too. It was, it was a moment of a kind of sharing that is involved in the richest exchanges between teacher and student. It was a moment that, regardless of how my education prepares me for my future life, had meaning. I am lucky to be able to tell similar stories about so many professors who have played this kind of role in my Stanford education. Rob Breesh, um, who I saw over there, he's somewhere here. Um, Jim Campbell and Tamar Herzog, who show such personal joy in debating me in, I think, um, helping a student figure out what she believes and why she should believe it. Sam Weinberg, who, after I came into his office just once, took it upon himself over the next months to provide both his, his encouragement and his sincere critique, all aimed at helping me become my intellectual and personal best. Raquel Baradas de Freitas, my tutor in legal philosophy at Oxford, who provided both my most rigorous academic experience and in herself a person to emulate. All these teachers understand that the returns from taking te teaching seriously, especially with students who aspire to be leaders one day, are enormous. In my own life, my teachers have not only increased my ability to grapple with a complex world, but have also helped me develop motivation and moral awareness. Those things cannot be taught impersonally. They require igniting a student's curiosity, taking her seriously, illustrating how what she studies relates to the world, and helping her see a vision of her future self to work toward. They involve a passionate commitment to helping students become all we can be. When that commitment is there, the returns from dedication to teaching are huge. But the truth is, the truth is when I think about the value of teaching, my heart is not in arguments about returns. They are important, but they fail to capture teaching's, teaching's most central value. That value is not discovered when a university is always caught up in objectives and thinking about the next step and how we are going to get there. It is discovered when we slow down to reflect. In these moments, we begin to remember why a university holds such enchantment in people's imaginations, why the mere idea of a place like Stanford can inspire awe on almost any corner of the globe. The university is a site for something special. The deepest meaning to be found at a university, a place of growing knowledge about the world, is in the sharing that takes place between teacher and student when a teacher helps a student expand her world. The potential returns of such relationships are tremendous, but to find their deepest value, we needn't be looking ahead. It rests in moments like the one I had with Lanier outside Sweet Hall. It is epitomized in the flourishing that takes place when a teacher's intellectual firepower and guidance help foster fruition. And that flourishing is part of a university's soul.